quite a few people starting to come in now, Paolo. So I think what we'll do is we'll make a, a start. Um, so welcome to everybody um, who are who are joining us uh, this afternoon for the third Learning and Teaching webinar series of the 2022-23 academic year. Um, today's session is going to be delivered by Paolo Vieira Braga. Um, now, Paolo um, has recently actually got a new role at the University of Suffolk as a research fellow. So I'd like to congratulate Paolo on achieving that role. Paolo's previous role was a data analyst for the Centre of Excellence in Learning and Teaching here at the University of Suffolk. Um, and in that role, and I presume you're going to carry this, this on, Paolo, is, is this idea of specialising in the application of data to support academic decision making. Now, Paolo's presentation is entitled Data. Has the time come for universities to focus on quality rather than quantity? Just a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over the reins to Paolo. Um, Paolo is going to uh, talk for around roughly 40 minutes, leaving uh, the final 20 minutes open for some questions and discussion. Please do use the Q&A function um, here on Zoom to leave your comments. Um, and what we will do, if you can leave your comments throughout the presentation, we will return to them in the final 20 minutes. Um, so without any further delay, Paolo, welcome to the series and over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. And uh, thanks, for me, thanks for inviting me to, to do this. Um, as for the 40 minutes, we are going to have just a few kind of discussions throughout those 40 minutes and, and maybe a few activities that we can kind of do together just to, just to build on the idea of, of understanding data and its usefulness. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so essentially the, the discussion is, is all about data. And, um, you know, has the time come for universities to focus on quality rather than quantity? Um, in my roles, I've, I've done quite a bit of evidence in progress um, in relation to regulatory agendas and uh, quite a bit over the last year in terms of institutional research. We've looked at bursaries, the impact they have on, on continuation for, for different student groups as well as the transition to block and blend, the impact that that's had for different student groups. And then there has also been a predictive modeling project that I've, that I've worked on in terms of predicting whether or not students maybe have an increased likelihood of, of withdrawing and how early we can make that prediction in order to, to intervene and support them. And while going through all of the data, it's, it's, it's been, it's been interesting to, to kind of see that there, there are definitely certain certain bits of data that are that are more useful for for what the aims of, of the university are as opposed to as opposed to some other bits of data. But of course usefulness is is subjective and and what might be useful for one is isn't useful for the other. In terms of in terms of this presentation, we are going to focus on, on student data and we're also going to try and look at what, what data is actually useful in the lecture room, you know, so as lecturers. So there will be a, a couple of scenarios where we kind of put our roles as lecturers and what kind of data we would we'd like access to and, and how we would use that. Um, first, you know, a typical data, data, data collection time the assumption that universities collect vast amounts of data um, that I know from le reading through the literature that does seem to be a common assumption and what I would like us to do is if we can if we can have a quick poll to actually test whether or not that assumption is is with us do do we believe that our university collects you know a vast amount of of student data so Phil if you could if you could please fire away that that poll that should be there now Yep, I can see people are answering. Perfect. I'm 
I'm not sure how we how we see the results of the poll. Okay, so I don't know if you can see the results, but I can. So would you like me to break them down for you? Yeah, please. So 13 out of 21, um, so 62% have said yes. Universities do um, have vast amounts of data. Only three out of 21, which equates to 14% said no, um, and five people suggested not sure, which accounts for about a quarter of participants. Excellent, perfect, thank you. Okay, so in, in our group here, we can see that that, that, assumption, that assumption is consistent. Um, how do I go back to my slides? Okay, so let's let's have a look at what student data is actually collected. So we know we've we've got an idea that there's loads of, of student data data that's collected, but what what is that data? Where does it come from? What's the process to it? Um, one of the first things we have is the student's um, records management system. So that would be in our case SIPS, and that collects a lot of data related to applications, enrollment. Um, also results and a few and a few other things. So that's that's one of the main sources of student data, or one system that we use. Then we've got the virtual learning environment. Now, our virtual learning environment we use Brightspace. That has you know course and module data, but then it also has student usage data, which from from my experience, that student usage data is 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 really quite good when you start thinking about it. It, you know interventions and things like that and then we've got other other sources of data that we are that we need to collect um, we've got the national student survey we've got the graduate outcome survey and then we've got institution initiated surveys and data collection processes now those are things that us as an institution we we do that either to facilitate our processes or because we are wanting to find out certain bits of information the interesting part is that when we look at all the data that a university collects, you'll find that the majority of that data we collect for regulators. So in our case, that would be OFS, but regulators have said, okay, in, in order for us to achieve our aims, we want you to basically collect this, this data and pass it over to us. So they looked at their, their aims and said what they want. And a lot of our data is is basically designed for for regulators and that's where that's where things i think start to get a little bit interesting when we when we compare but when we think that our data as a whole has basically been collected for regulators if we compare regulators and universities overall the aims are fairly similar you've got regulators they are aiming for equal opportunities um, they want excellent student outcomes and student experience, and universities are quite similar. They, they, they all want the same things. However, in terms of the data, huh? regulators use data. Their unit of analysis is universities. It's, it's inanimate institutions, and they build up those, those, all the universities together to get a sector-wide view of what equal opportunities, student outcomes, and student experience looks like. Whereas for a university, their unit of analysis is students. It's, it's not inanimate. We're talking about individuals. And when we think about how we, want to, how we want to use that data, regulators are thinking about monitoring the sector. You know, okay, so we've highlighted that, you know, let's say, for example, BAME students, they, they are less likely to continue their studies to white students. You know, as an institution, we want you to address that. But when you look at an, a, a university, you're wanting to influence individuals' behavior. If BAME students are, are less likely to continue, we need to understand the students. We need to re relate to an individual and find ways to influence that behavior for them to continue their studies. I mean, that is just one, one example that, that we're looking at. But this difference between a university as a unit of analysis and a student is really important because it's it's highlighting that we as universities are dealing with the individuals regulators aren't 
And yet the majority of our data collection is relating to a regulator's agenda. It's not, it's not necessarily universities. So universities have been a bit kind of reactive. We've, we've got this data that we collect for other people. Let's see if we can try and, you know, use this data to try and influence, influence individuals. But yet a lot of it isn't, isn't always useful for, for that purpose. So for when we think about regulator, you know, typical regulator data, you've got a lot of protected characteristics and, and, and other things. So you've got, for example, the age of a student, the ethnicity, the sex, are they from a least participated neighborhood, an index of multiple deprivation, disability, their mode of attendance. You've got a lot of the demographic profile of a student that is being collected. Now, if we look at this regulator data, I'm wanting us to go into our first kind of, our first little activity together. As, as a lecturer, how would you use this data about your students to support them continuing their studies and improving their academic performance? There's a QR code there that will link you to, to a, a, Padlet, a Padlet website. Um, I'll, share, I'll share the link as well. Um, let me stop sharing now and, and share the link. Essentially, there's an example in the Padlet that, that we can use. Right, I've, I've sent through a link and Okay, so if you follow the link with a QR code, it will take you to, to this page. Um, if you click on the page, you, you'll open up, it's got all the different types of data, and there's the question. The example that we look at here is knowing a student has a disability, for example, maybe you could ensure that a lecture room is easily accessible. Um, in the comment section, you can just add, however you as a lecturer, would use bits of this information. If you knew this, this kind of information about your students, how would you use that to basically support them continuing their studies or improving their academic performance? I think we'll do that for a few minutes and just have a little bit of a discussion around, around the ideas that, that we generate and that we can think of. Phil, have you have you got an have you got the link that I've sent through? Yes, that's come. To send it to everyone. It's come through. Okay, so let me share it. So that should go to everybody now.
that'll be giving us some really nice ideas here. So knowing knowing if their first language is not English, being able to adapt to the audience, you know, avoid using colloquialism, slang, etc. Teaching with learning difficult difficulties, perhaps students would prefer to learn from videos rather than slides. There are learning difficulties as well. Avoiding technical jargon. Yeah, these are perfect. Um, if if we, I'm going to continue with with the presentation now. If we look at that, we can see that we've got we've got certain certain indicators there, like we said, disability that's being used nationality for, for English as a first language. The English one is, is quite interesting because knowing that, knowing that English is maybe not a first language, can, we can maybe adapt to the audience. But English, th that's working on an assumption. Okay, so if they, you know, if we do know that they, that English is in their first language, we can just provide them extra support. But some, some students, their, their English skills, even though it's not their first language, may be quite high. But maybe if we understood what English skills were for, for all students, we could, actually, we could actually target all students that need it. It doesn't necessarily need to maybe relate to their nationality or anything, that could be a particular skill. Um, there's a few more coming in. Being inclusive from, from the outset as well. So there's quite a bit of that information that, that we can use, but there's something, there's something interesting about that. When, when we're looking at, at that kind of data, we are making certain assumptions as, we, as we're using it. So let's... Bring down. <laughs> okay. I'm going to share my slides again. Okay, so this is a lot of re regulator data, how we can use it. And I mean, like I said, the, the English one is, is quite interesting. So there's definitely ways that we that we can use this data. Knowing that we can we can use it in, in the lecture room. So the thing is, there are certain bits of this data that we also can't use. So for example, sex, you know, what what could we really use use that for? And when we do start using some of these things, we are we are starting to make assumptions about the population. So using protected characteristics can open up a bit of stigmatization and things like that. So if we were to, you know, create maybe an, an intervention that just focused on, on ethnicity, if, if we are grouping people from any particular ethnic, ethnicity altogether, that could lead to stigmatization. It, it, it could be borderline discriminatory. And that's where things are a little bit difficult when it comes to, you know, us dealing with, with individuals. However, there are certain there are certain predictors of academic achievement that have constantly been with us, you know, research has been around that point us to individual, individual behaviors, behavior, traits, thoughts, feelings that, that exclude those kind of protected characteristics, even though they, they are, they, they maybe can reduce the gaps of, of equal opportunities. One of these, for example, is, is prior academic achievement. Um, there's been research over, over many of the years that prior academic achievement is an indicator to help support a student. So prior academic achievement doesn't necessarily mean pre-university. So for a first year student, it could be, be pre-university. However, for second year students, their prior academic achievement would be their first year. So the most recent prior academic achievement has the most is the most predictive. Um, 
So there's prior academic achievement, the English academic skills, that's another one. I mean, you can see literature goes back to the, to the 80s, talking about how English academic skills influences academic achievement. If that's, you know, withdrawal or academic performance, knowing to use English in an academic way is, is, is helpful and, and the links are there. Um, another one is conscientiousness. Conscientiousness, again, we've got a lot of research around the impact that conscientiousness plays on, on students' academic achievement, their, whether or not they withdraw. Um, I know there was one study, I think it was Morris and Fritz, that looked at conscientiousness and procrastination, basically the opposite of it. And there they were, they were basically quite similar in the, in the results that they used. So there, there are proxies that one, that one can use as well. Um, if we think about sense of belonging, this this one this one's got quite a bit of um, research recently about it, and it's about whether students actually feel that they belong belong at a university. Again, a lot of research showing that these are the things that impact withdrawal, you know, um, and academic performance. And the last one they'll add to the list is um, lecturer attendance. It's interesting that we've we have systems that that we can use for recording lecture attendance and things but we maybe don't always always use them to their to their full ability and when 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 we look at the literature of course if we look at you know a few decades back lecture attendance was maybe very typically in the classroom so it was its nature was very was very straightforward you know did a did a student go to go to the lecture or not Whereas as, as time went on, you know, lecture attendance started to have certain, certain nuances about it. If a student is online and they, and they watch in a lecture, does that count? If they watch in recorded um, lectures, is that counting as, as attendance? And even with the, the move to online spaces, recent research still shows that then viewing lectures and engaging with, with that kind of content Still, still has a positive association with their, their academic achievement and whether or not they withdraw. So here we've got we've got five five factors, predictors of academic achievement that we know that they've been around. These aren't these aren't new sources of information, but we know that they are that they are there. Um, if we were to look at a sense of belonging, for example, um, I know that. Um, sense of belonging has been linked to has been linked to withdrawal. There's there's research that, that enforces that. And then interestingly there was there was a study that I read about a customized sense of belonging intervention. So an intervention that, that the university created just to focus on promoting a sense of belonging. And they they did small things, you know, creating that kind of peer engagement. They they even gave um, certain like um, university associated merchandise. They did small things to just basically encourage that sense of belonging among, among, among students. And the effect that it has was, was really positive. Students started to not only feel that they belong at the university, but it reduced, it reduced their, their withdrawal rates and, and it um, improved academic achievement. It comes as no surprise that when you looked at the characteristics of, of these students that typically have a lower, lower sense of, of belonging, they were, they were Bain students had, had a typically lower sense of belonging than, than other students, um, as well as um, first generation students. So there are these links that maybe show that they are, they are basically proxies. It's understanding the individual. Then withdrawing is not it's not their the race that makes that makes them withdraw their ethnicity. It's it's an individual that's making a decision. They they are feeling a certain way that's leading them to make a decision. And using variables or, or using predictors such as like a sense of belonging, you actually understand and you can now start to target an intervention in a different way. So if we were um, if if a university, if we can go hypothetically for, for a moment, if a university was to collect all of this data about a student, you know, prior academic achievement, 
conscientiousness, a sense of belonging. You, you knew their academic, uh, English academic skills. You knew if they were attending. How would you use those variables? So as a lecturer, you, you've got all this information about your students now. How would you use that in order to support them with their studies and improving their academic performance? Um, there's a QR code. Phil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send through, I'm gonna send you the link and if you could please share it with, with the group. Yeah, will do. Okay, that should be in the chat. Perfect. So if you follow that link, you'll, you'll be taken to another Padlet. And their example there is, you know, knowing, knowing that a student has a lower level of conscientiousness, maybe you could offer time management and planning suggestions during a PAC session. some suggestions, some comments coming in already. We've got contact in early to check in if they're okay, if they need assistance. Um, knowing students have certain needs regarding academic skills, you can focus, you know, focus on um, signposting them to the academic skills team. Very true, that can happen early on, especially if, as, soon as, you, as soon as you know about these things. Um, signpost to other support teams if they need help encourage attendance by including in-class activities and motivate students, for example, workshops related to the assessment. Group activities to increase sense of belonging, brilliant. That's, that, is, that is one important way to, to increase sense of belonging, is that engagement with peers. Um, sense of belonging, you can work to focus on Building a sense of community. If you are aware there are students low in this metric, think about language that they use, we rather than you, or the student, in the way that depersonalizes the experience. Absolutely love that. Engage with course leaders. Well, there's quite a few ideas, ideas coming out here. We've got um, shoes with low prior academic achievement, offer get ahead schemes. Excellent. There we are. So even before they start university, you can, you can think about programs that could maybe just give them a bit of upskilling, preparing them for, for, for university. So when they start, it's not too much of a shock. Um, including course activities as well as you know, whether there are specific requirements they need. It must mean there are loads of ideas here. Add extra materials on academic writing, if needed with, with academic skills. Yeah, look at that. Um, there's there's loads of ideas ideas being popped out there, and I think I think that's that's an interesting. Let me get back to back to my slides. I think it's really interesting when we when we think about basically when we when we look and we compare those those two sets of data. The typical regulator data, there were loads of variables there. I mean, the, the majority of the slide was basically just different sets of, of, um, of, of data points that, that a person can use. Whereas now we've just looked at, at five in particular, and we're talking about really specific, specific things relating to the individual, that sense of belonging, you know, creating a, a peer group, encouraging that. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we are talking about where a person, a lecturer in their, in their room can create, create some kind of intervention that's supporting the university's overall objectives. 
and it's happening it's happening naturally because you're aware and because you've got you've got access to that data the interesting part is that when we when we look at these sorts of data and things like that universities don't traditionally collect this data um, i know that there has been a sense of belonging that has been that has been um, is becoming more of, of, of something that universities collect but that kind of proactive proactive stance from a university to be like, listen, we need data for this. Let's aim on, on, on collecting data. This is, this is what we need data on. That, that traditionally doesn't, doesn't happen. And I think that's the shift that, that really is, is, is starting to happen. Universities are becoming aware of these things. And when they are wanting to create interventions, they are, they are starting to, to look at look at the literature and base their data collection practices on it. Um, there are there are certain challenges though. I mean, when we when we think about when we think about data in general, and especially if we were looking at those at those variables and we wanted to start collecting them, um, to collect that kind of data, the first area is going to be integrating it with with your current systems so getting a sense of belonging you know when would you ask that to students because if you've got a thousand students and you're only getting um, responses from 50 students it's difficult to create an intervention a meaningful one that that applies to to the student population but there are certain ways we can piggyback on on current systems so if we were to think about where are the main data collection um, well, cycles in in the student year. We've got enrollment where we can start to collect some of that data. We've got module feedback, and and then we have induction as well. So with module feedback, I mean that's that's happening after a, a few weeks. That can be something where you ask about sense of belonging and and things like that. When we start to look at English English language skills. Um, prior academic achievement, if we're looking at conscientiousness, those things could be more integrated with the with the enrollment stage and the and the application stage. However, there is there is an underlying underlying thing that we all need to consider, and that's basically the ethics about about that. You know, if if we are collecting, let's say, conscientiousness, if we are measuring conscientiousness of students, you know, is that is that okay? I mean, if we get students to to opt in and and they've got informed consent and they're aware of what we what we're using the data for, then then it should be fine. But the whole ethics about using using the data for interventions is is really quite quite an interesting an interesting topic because typically, if you look at regulators' data, you've got you've got a lot of protected characteristics. And if you are using those protected characteristics to create interventions, you've got to be wary of, of, of discriminating, stigmatization, and then even creating, creating you know, predictive models that, that are actually biased. If you focus on, on other factors where it's like conscientiousness, um, prior academic achievement, sense of belonging, these ones, these kinds of variables don't have the same the same kind of um, problems that that come with protected characteristics however it's additional data that you're asking for people and and students need to give their consent when when, when you are collecting such data even even if it is really useful i think phil if you're if you're right maybe if we could have a bit of a discussion around around ethics and um just when I would just like to find out from the audience, basically, when, when you looked at those those sets of those sets of data and that, and you thought about using that data in the classroom, was there anything that kind of just made you feel like, mm, you know, maybe maybe it's not okay to be using that? So please use the the Q and A function um, in response to Paolo there, please.
Okay, so uh, Nick Nick has said they're not static measures, Paolo. Yeah, yeah, they they do move they do move around. I mean, when you're looking at at variables like prior academic achievement, um, English language skills, they they do move and. If we do collect them at one point, you know, like enrollment, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it stays it stays that that way. So that's that's certainly that's certainly a challenge when it comes to when it comes to using the data, especially as the student progresses. And uh, Charles Charles has suggested very interesting. I think one of the challenges is what do we actually want to do with this data? You see lots of data collected, fire out to schools, departments, but no clear routes to interventions, or often even that the school has done anything with it. Yeah, I mean that's that, that is that pretty much sums sums it all up really what do you actually want to do that's that's the point so if you are wanting to get good student outcomes if you're wanting to increase the student student experience you know what data helps you achieve exactly those those goals if it's if it's continuing and it's getting consumers students to continue their studies find out what what basically predicts a student a student continuing their studies. What are the factors that make them want to drop out? And then from there, collect the data and build build an intervention. But collecting data for for data's sake, I mean, to to what end really? It's 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 basically like playing Cinderella. We've got all this data, and we're walking around with Cinderella shoe, trying to see where it fits. I mean, we should we should be doing something a little more targeted. And, and do you get the sense, Paula, that there is a, almost a data overload in, I guess, education institutions more generally, but universities more specifically? Yeah, I think, I, th I think it's pretty much a, a global state at the moment where it's just collect as much data as you want. It's, it's not so much thought about exactly as, um, as Charles said, it's not what do we want to use the data for, but it's more just collect as much data as you can and and then let's see afterwards and i mean that's that as itself is is a bit of is a bit of a concern when you think about gdpr you need to you need to know what you want to use data for collecting high quality data as opposed to quantity is 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 just worth it you make your your whole efforts more efficient you you become more effective and that's that's the start of, of a meaningful intervention. And Chris has suggested that the key challenge from his perspective is balancing the use of data to create a personalized experience to enhance uh, individual students' learning versus this, uh, this idea of ensuring consistency for all students. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing is that <laughs> I, I I agree with I agree with um, Chris. You when you're wanting to create an intervention, you're wanting to it's you're wanting to help certain groups of students. You've got that equal opportunities point of view. Wanting to create something consistent that applies to all students. I mean that is that is the default learning experience. You come into uni, you go to your freshers week, you start doing your studying. That that is the default, but creating those kinds of personalized personalized views where you know about who the individual is i mean that's that's where interventions where interventions are the most successful it's, it's understanding individuals us viewing students as the whole student population isn't helpful we need to look at our student population and know individuals That's fascinating. Um, Christian asks, at what level can one use data for interventions, individual group or cohort? And I think that you've kind of touched on that there, but would you like to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think as, as, for, as for interventions, they, they are at all of those different levels, really. Um, so if you're looking longitudinally, you would, you would definitely use a cohort and just and just track that group of students if you have applied an intervention to them but it's it's at all levels really generally you are you are thinking from the top down a 
a university may have an objective to have increased their con continuation rate. But as you start to go down, you can maybe have an institution wide kind of intervention that applies to all schools and is and is broad, such as, you know, a predictive model that identifies students that are at risk. But then you can you can go further down if we go in to to the point where lecturers have got that personalized view of of the students that are in their in their lecture rooms you can really start to get to that individual kind of interaction. I mean, PAC sessions are, are, are another example of relating to the individual, but knowing and understanding what, what, what data we have on that specific individual can really just facilitate that, that interaction. So for, for, for Christian's comment, it's pretty much at all levels, really. Thank you. And, and one more from David. So David has asked, what happens if you gain consent to use data for one purpose, but further down the line decide it might be beneficial or essential to use it for something else? Do you ask for consent again? I mean, my gut off the bat is saying that you've got to ask for consent again. If you've if you have if you have asked for 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 using their data for one specific purpose and then later you're wanting to use it for a different purpose you have to ask them if it's okay to use it i think that that would be a one things that i know open university does this and this is quite this is quite controversial but when a student enrolls they they basically part of their enrollment um process they inform the student that their student data will be used for for research purposes as well and they leave it broad they don't they don't make it too specific and they just say that you know your data is going to be used it's going to be used for for the institution and for and for research they do anonymize it and and make sure that students aren't identifiable but they do that in the enrollment process That's interesting. And I, I guess one, one thing that I would suggest, and, and maybe it, I think it got alluded to on the Padlets, um, is that almost in terms of workload, who would this be a combination of lecturers working with data analysts, or would this predominantly fall under the role of lecturers themselves, teachers, educators as well? Almost what would it look like in practical terms? Well, that's interesting because I think it can be it can be a combination of, of of things really. If if data analysts and and you've got a good kind of like business intelligence platform, if a if a lecturer opens up a dashboard as as Chris was Chris had mentioned earlier, and you know the profile of your students, you know which ones or maybe have got lower levels of conscientiousness, which ones maybe are, are lower with with English and so on, as part of your your lecture preparation, in that you can kind of accommodate for for those for those differences that exist. Um, but there, for example, the 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 work between data analysts and and so on would be about creating that dashboard. Um, at an institution level, there are different teams. So, for example, the the predictive model that's being run now for for the retention program. You've got the student experience ambassadors that are using are using the data to to engage with with students and try to promote a kind of sense of belonging and and you know monitor their their engagement their, their bright space engagement so it can be different elements teams can be dedicated to interventions but it's it's kind of the whole university working together i don't think i don't think that requiring lecturers to do anything outside of what they're already doing is 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 this is going to be helpful i think it's more it's more kind of providing lecturers with data that can help inform their their lectures and their planning that's really interesting and, and that sort of taps into to christian's comments about data literacy and um, so christian suggests that data in itself is agnostic interpretation is the key so thank you for those comments there, everyone. Okay. Um, 
so Phil, are my slides still showing? I'm not sure. They are, yes. Okay. So just concluding remarks from what we've seen. I mean, we, we know that universities do, do have a vast amount of data, but we also know that a lot of that data is for regulators' objectives. And using, using universities, their own objectives and targeting how they plan to collect to collect information that achieves that is maybe something that should be should be promoted and encouraged. Um, we we had a look at we had a look at ethics, um, and yeah, we've we've covered about the the less proactive approach in in collecting data that is that is backed by research. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything, please fire them fire them our way. Yes, so we have some questions coming in. So Carmen, uh, nice for you to join us, Carmen. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, what are your views on using a digital passport that students themselves complete and provide this type of data to lecturers and other stakeholders, such as ASX passports? And how realistic uh, can this idea, idea be considering GDPR? Thanks for your question, Carmen. Um... I'm not. I'm not sure about that. That that particular system. I'm not sure what they'd be what they'd be filling in or how they'd be using it. I do know that from from a pilot a pilot study that the OFS um, uh, funded, they basically looked at at you know these kinds of things, learning gains and relate getting students to engage and things like that, and they spent. Four million, four million pounds doing that. And one thing that was consistent across the 70 um, institutions was that getting, getting students to fill in data is, is, is a challenge. They, they really, that's where, that's where all universities fall, sh fall short. So building, building basically data collection pro processes into, into like student student processes that are already in place, like enrollment and module feedback. That's the, the most successful way to, to collect information from students. Thank you, and thank you for your question, Carmen. Uh, Paolo, Mabel has asked, when, request, when requesting for data from students, uh, would it be better to let students know the reasons for asking for such data? Um, Mabel believes that this would better help improve students' experience and then ensure the wrong data is not given. Yeah, I mean, I think I, th I think being as open as possible about you know what what you're using the data for and and what the plans are. I think that's just that's just the ethical thing to do. I think I, I would definitely encourage that all the way. I think in the instances like OU where they where they just they kind of take away that that kind of part of of getting students' data. I just, I suppose, I just feel that I'm I'm uncomfortable with it. I feel the most the most ethical would be exactly that. Let them know the reasons and how you plan on using it. Thank you, and thank you for your question, Mabel. Uh, Simon has asked: Are there any questions slash measures we could collect for at the start of a module? So, for example, in week one. Um, that could be used to meaningfully adjust our delivery? Uh, and what sorts of things would you recommend focusing these questions or measures around? That is interesting. Um, so we're talking about first week, first week survey. Honestly, I think within the first week, if you, if, if you've got access to the module on Brightspace, looking looking at um, looking at engagement, that is that is definitely um, one indicator whether or not students have actually logged onto their module and they're engaging with the content. That can be a, a predictor of, of of what's to come. But in terms of in terms of that information, of wanting to know about students, in order to to adjust delivery, I think. 
I think that could be a bit challenging. The, the information that we spoke about, for example, the regulator data, that's, that's data that the university has. So I feel like if a lecturer had access to that kind of data of their students, you could start, you could start using that to, to adjust your delivery even before, even before week one, because you would have some kind of idea that it's there. But it's about sharing, sharing that information. I mean, lecturers do need, do need data on, on their students. I'm sorry, Simon, I haven't, I haven't really, I haven't really helped you much with that question. <laughs> Sense of belonging, go for that one. It's an easy, quick one. Ask them about their sense of belonging. Getting that that information from students. And and how would you, how would you do that? What would what would that look like in practice? For example, in in the first week of a module. I suppose if you were going to run your 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 own survey, I don't know I don't know exactly if you could if you could maybe do something on on Brightspace. Maybe just a short, short survey about um, about sense of belonging, or whether or not you prefer to to touch base with students. But I think that would be an easy one. I think you know, do you feel that do you feel that you you belong at at the university? Is is a quick question that that's quite helpful. Simon has clarified that it was quite an abstract question, so don't. Don't um, prophesize that one too much, Paolo. It was, it was a good question. Um, and David has asked um, almost a scenario, I guess. Um, suppose you're considering a group of students rather than individuals. Do the predictors of academic achievement still apply for the group overall? Yep, certainly. If, if, these, if these predictors apply at an individual level, as soon as you start to group the individual, the averages the averages remain. So a student with a lower a lower conscientious conscientiousness level, if you've got as as you add students to it and it and it becomes a group, you'll notice that they that those with lower levels of, of conscientiousness do do tend to to perform poorly. So yeah, the, these predictors are applicable at an individual level and they can be expanded all the way up to, to an institution level. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the questions that have come in. We've probably got a few more minutes before we will conclude the webinar. So if there are any more questions, please do fire them in and do so quite quickly, please. Um, Paolo, I guess one, one of my questions would, would almost be um, how closely could universities work with other phases of education, particularly maybe further education or, or schools, to develop um, the, an understanding of, of, for example, conscientiousness, uh, attendance, examples like that how closely how much is it a, a process of, of working with others outside of the university environment um so in terms of english language skills i know look i know two things the the regulators are encouraging universities to basically start start engaging more with with earlier with, with early education from primary, high school, and, and so on. And when they do look at interventions and things like that, they have looked at things like summer schools and, and so on. However, there was, there was research done by the University of Bournemouth that um, looked at a specific intervention program for, for reading skills. And after the intervention, it was really successful. And they found that some students were actually able to increase their reading age by, by a full year just based on that intervention so i think that is that is one example where universities can actually maybe use their skills that that they have to actually run programs in in um earlier in the education cycle that can maybe boost things like for example english academic skills and and things like that but that whole process of universities engaging with with those externally relating to, to some of these factors is something that 
that is recently being encouraged by by regulators. So I think we'll see more in that space. That's really interesting, and I think it comes down to those transitions, doesn't it? And and the communication between almost creating that pathway for individual students, so that universities aren't starting from scratch when the student starts in their first year. Um, oh, have we got one more question? Yeah, Mabel, she's she's asked she's asked a question. That's my dream. <laughs> Ah, right. Well, I, I, I can't I can't deny you the opportunity to um, just speak about that. So Mabel has asked, is there a way universities all over the world could have a unified data pool where students information, regardless of school, can be found? I mean, is there a way and is it possible? Certainly. We've we've got the Internet. We have the systems that kind of that kind of system could could be developed and and it could exist. Um, will it happen? I, I, I doubt it. It's, 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 a, it's a really nice idea, but there are so many, the way, the way that universities collect data is all a little bit different. The systems that they use are all a bit different. They've all got their own regulators putting pressure on them that are specific to each of their countries. And I think for them to find the time and the resource to actually embark on something, on something that, that big, is 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 going to be is going to be unlikely but i would i would i would love that to happen <laughs> it would be nice i imagine that discussion has taken place at the the oecd level i imagine it's yeah. it's in <laughs> yeah. it's in those discussions take place there um okay so what we'll do is we'll we will uh sort of work towards concluding the webinar um, now. So thank you very much for everybody's questions. Um, there were some really, really interesting topics of discussion there. Um, so that concludes our final session of 2022. Um, the next session, as you can see um, that I asked Paolo to include at the end of his slide, is on the 11th of January at 4 p.m. Uh, of 2023. And it is Dr. Ruth Flaherty, um, who is presenting the title Minions and the Maker Movement, Making Complex Learning More Accessible. Now, what I will do is I will post the registration into the chat so that you can get signed up for that now. And I would also encourage you to take a look at our YouTube page to consider some of the previous um, talks that have taken place within the series. I will also post that link now. So all that's left for me to say is a huge thanks to, to Paolo for your um, time and effort in, in, in creating this presentation. It is most appreciated. Thank you for everybody for your engagement and, and discussion. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I hope you have a lovely break uh, with friends and family over the festive period. Have a lovely evening. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.